you do that reverse sear, it just, it takes all that guesswork out. All day long, we hear people who come in and they bought for the first time. What's the difference? Why is this so much better? Pretty much every cut we sell, it's like a five-star restaurant quality meat. We really want you to take this home, eat it, and just be blown away by the flavor and really tell the difference on what you're getting here. Full grill is a happy grill. Perfectly tender. And would you like to try some? This is melting in your mouth. Carnivore candy. You like to see people enjoy what you're doing, you know? When you go to your butcher, you should be looking for quality. If you think you've got something, just hustle. It's on your shoulders. And we're trying to do the best we can every day for a good product. At the end of the day, it's just going to be quality. That's how you can stamp this whole thing. I'm Jason Lee. I own Levon's Fine Meats and Levon's Meat Duster. These wings have already been seasoned, but I figure we hit them a little bit again. That's a mainstay in the shop. We usually have those on a daily basis. What you buy in this shop is not what you buy at a grocery store. When you go to a butcher or somebody, you should be looking for quality, not just a piece of meat. You can go anywhere and get that. A lot of what you go and you get in a grocery store as opposed to a butcher shop is all highly processed, highly touched, and pumped out. What you get at a shop like this is something that has a lot of love and care put into it. It gets a lot better nutrition, it gets a lot better feed, it gets a lot better care on its day-to-day -day life and the meat shows. These aren't coming from mass processing slaughterhouses where it's get them in and out as quick as you can. We really want you to take this home and really tell the difference on what you're getting here. So this is your bone-in ribeye. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut right across the seam here and peel off the backbone. Bone-in ribeye, now taking off the backbone. It's your beef back ribs, all ready to go. We're gonna take our ribeye and we usually cut our sticks about an inch and a quarter, a little bit thicker than most places. If a lot of people will come up for a ribeye and they want spinalis, that's their favorite part. So the spinalis is this part right here. It's the most tender part of the, the ribeye. It's got the most marbling. It's the cap of the beef. So that part right there is going to basically melt in your mouth. And this part starts to turn into more of a New York. So you, if you can tell, it's not as speckled as that. But if you were in the know with ribeye, this is the cut you want. So if you look, that top spinalis is almost this entire piece of meat. You should go visit your local butcher, whether it's me or anyone else. You're gonna get a little more attention to just you, what your needs are, as opposed to they need a clean up in aisle four, you know, things like that. This is a hanger steak, hanging tender, ugly steak, ugly hanger steak, whatever you wanna call it. This is the piece of meat that started everything. This ugly monstrosity right here, it comes off the belly of the cow, What's so unique about it is it, it's near a lot of the, the veins that are near the organs. But what that does is it gives it a very intense, very strong beef flavor. Imagine beef amplified. My favorite piece of meat that leaves here is that hanger steak. A year and a half ago, I didn't know what a hanger steak was. I had never heard of one. I found out what it was. I had a new favorite steak that I didn't know until I was 46 years old or whatever. Now this is one of the more rare cuts. There's a few steaks out there that people will be like, oh, that's a butcher's cut. What a butcher's cut was, is when a cow is broken down, the most tender parts of the meat, there's a couple pieces of. So with this, for example, there's only one per cow. So what the butcher would do is after he broke down his cow and sold everything else, this was the piece of meat he took home. And in a grocery store, for example, customers don't want to buy the ugly stuff. They want the nice, pretty, bright red meat. And the hanger is very ugly. That's why it's known as an ugly steak. What's crazy for me is I spent about a decade in grocery stores, being a meat cutter, manager, all that fun stuff. Never saw one of these until about a year ago when I got into the actual butcher shop industry instead of uh, grocery stores. It's the cuts of meat that you can't get in the grocery store, like the hanger steak, the pecanias. And this, you might be looking at, well, what the, what's that chunk of fat right there? This is your pecania. This has become extremely popular in the last couple of years. Now, a pecania and a top sirloin are the same piece of meat. The pecania is the top muscle of the top sirloin. So if it was a whole piece of meat, it'd be about this big, covered in fat, and you'd have to peel this off, and it would be probably about twice that size of just fat. And once it's all cleaned up, that's what it looks like. So a pecania is interesting. There's a lot of things you can do with it. You can whole roast it or you can cut it into steaks. Contrary to everything else, all the other steaks we've cut, you cut against the grain. With this, you want to cut with the grain super marbled and it's got this giant chunk of fat on it we don't take that fat off and what you do is when you cook it you reverse sear it so you set it off to the side on your grill let it cook slow and then you sear it at the end this 
crisps up and all that flavor, that fat melts into the meat. One of the most popular steaks in the last few years. I've been in this industry almost a decade and Picanha only blew up in the last few years. I make no qualms that I'm not the pro, the expert, but I knew I needed one. Charlie's kind of quiet, doesn't say a lot, but once I got him talking, found out we had a lot of stuff in common. We have a lot of the same likes and stuff, and he comes in here to work. You can go to a trade school and learn this, but I learned it just kind of being tossed into the fire. And there's actually a pretty big rivalry between meat cutters, which is what I am, and breakers or traditional butchers. We're both important. The main difference is butchers and breakers work in a warehouse generally, and they just have to tear down the meat and then send it to the stores where we have to take what they do and process it and make it as pretty as, as possible. You want people to come in and see a good piece of meat. You don't want to look like somebody's been hacking and sawing on it. You want the meat to look nice and presentable. It's an important part of it. Everything has to look a certain way. You might be asking, why am I not using the saw to cut through this? A saw with boneless meat tends to turn it really fast. That meat is gonna turn dark at a much faster rate than it would if I hand cut it. We hand cut almost everything here. Only a few items do we ever put on the saw if it has a bone in it. And if we can work around the bone, then we work around the bone. You always wanna put paper between your meat because if meat touches meat, it starts to turn brown. And what that means for us is it's a lot harder to sell. Nothing's wrong with it. That doesn't make any issues, no problems. People don't wanna buy their meat if it's not bright red. And unfortunately in our world, the darker meat turns, the browner it turns, the more flavor it has. If you've ever seen dry aged beef, it's a very dark, almost ugly color. And it's super flavorful. I think a lot of people get caught up with, you have to do something this way. You have to do something that way. You know, there's a lot of people, you should never season a steak. You should eat the steak. You want to taste the steak. Well, I like my steak seasoned. But I think it's important that you let everybody do what they want to do with their food. Today, we're going to hit the hanger steak, one of these filet mignon, both of these ribeye with steak seasoning. Make sure all the meat is just covered, basically. You don't want to pile it up on top of it to where all you taste is the seasoning. You just kind of want the seasoning to add to the meat. Give it a nice balanced flavor. I've somehow created something that people like as far as the seasoning and then the butcher shop. I had always been putting stuff together, trying to come up with my own little mix. I just kind of wanted to where you go to a barbecue. I always thought it'd be kind of cool to bring your own thing and see if people would dig what you were doing. Once we started making it and handing it out to people and seeing if there really was a market, we started finding out that people were putting it on everything. When we first started selling that stuff, I went up to biker events that go on. So you can only imagine most of the people came up to the table and like, why are you here? Then they would taste the seasoning and go, now you know why we're here. That's it. 90 to 95% of all that seasoning has been somebody holding their hand out. We shake it in, they lick their hand, they hand us money, transaction over. It's just flavor. This is where I'm different than most. A lot of people say you should rub it in, push it in, something like that. I usually don't. I just let it set for like 10 or 15 minutes at room temperature. The meat will kind of start to absorb it a little bit. Then I flip it over and hit the other side. And like these fillets, after they've rested, I'll take a lot of this stuff, roll the sides. Same with the ribeyes. Get some more seasoning all the way around it. Get all these caps and stuff seasoned up as well. These are the easiest things in the world. Deep fry them, air fry them, barbecue them, just add heat. That's all you need is just to cook them and they're good to go. Again, all, all this stuff's an accident for this guy. I, I've got other professionals that work in here, but I'm not one of them. I'm just, I, I know what I like to eat and if I'm, I guess it turns out I know what a lot of other people like to eat too maybe. And I always feel like it takes a village. I think it takes all of us to pull it all together and make it all happen and it all work and look and do what you want it to, you know what I mean? For me, I would say if you think you've got something, you just got to go out there and push it and hustle it and then try to get people on board with you to try and push and hustle with you, you know? We're going to eat, brother. We got Fat Ox Barbecue with Saucy Luke and Ty out there doing their thing, serving up all the things you can buy in the store and go home and cook. I can cook decently, but I thought it'd be a better idea to have the pros come and do it. We're just kind of giving a test run so people can check out what we're doing and the quality of meat we're selling. Great opportunity for me. Why not be a great opportunity for them as well? They're in a hustle just like I am. If I can help spread that in some way, I absolutely will every time without question. Full girl is a happy girl. Let's get this thing shut up. 
you got to start working. As much as you want to like always keep checking at it, if you're looking, it ain't cooking. Say for a competition, we have a six hour cook on, on something. If we're checking it a lot, dude, that six hour cook could easily turn to eight hours. That's one of the hard things with this is a lot of times you don't see the end thing. You know, we get the meat ready, we prepare it. At the end, you go home and then it's a mystery to us unless you come back and tell us about it. I think it's probably one of the most satisfying parts when somebody comes in here, buys a piece of meat, buys a seasoning. We see them a week later, two weeks later, and they come in and explain to us how that was the best meal they've ever had. And it came out of our little shop and all they had to do was add the heat to get everything hot. That's really satisfying. This is what they call, it's a traditional offset barbecue, offset smoker. Starts at 300 towards the front, 275, 250-ish on that back burner. So it's a pretty consistent heat. Depending on what we're cooking, we adjust the meats where we want them. Kind of find our hot spots, whatever we need to find. Chicken wings, we're running them towards the hot side. Chicken typically gets a little rubbery when you, when you smoke at low temp, so we like to do it on a higher temp just so that skin can crisp up a little bit. Chicken, you know, we usually get it done about 165. Uh, pork is about 145 to 155-ish. Uh, but we run the pork and the chicken towards the hot side. So back here on the end, we got more of our beef, our cuts that we're looking for like a medium rare finish. That's the hard part with thick cuts of meat, um, those, those really thick ribeyes, prime ribs, everything like that. Sometimes when you do them too hot, too fast, it doesn't get cooked through the middle, so you have like extreme rare. Uh, that's what the reverse sear kind of helps with that because you get that internal temp up, then sear it off and you get a really nice cut. So now we're gonna give a quick little sear on them on the firebox. These picanhas have a nice fat cap over the top. You get, you get a good sear on these, you get a good little cap. You do that reverse sear, it just, it takes all that guesswork out. What we always try to tell people is like, trust the time, trust the temperature it's reading. Filet mignon, carnivore candy. And would you like to try some? Yeah. This is melting your mouth. And you can see it in people's faces. When people talk about food, there's sometimes a glow. I like it to where people can come in here and talk and laugh and chop it up for a minute and, Oh, check out what I cooked last week. You know, we have customers that come in and want to share that stuff. That's cool. We're opening the door in a friendly way. We're here to help you. We're here to make sure you go home and that centerpiece of your meal is good and it's what you want. And it's going to put a smile on everybody at the table's face. I think the hardest part of it, any of it, to be honest with you, is just taking that initial leap. And I think that's the biggest thing that I've learned from this, that you can support yourself, you can do it. Kind of sad that it took me till 45, 46 to figure out I could hustle for myself. I wish I would have learned it in my 20s, but it feels good. I think if somebody has an idea and you really believe that your thing could possibly work, why are you not trying to do it? That initial move, that's the hardest. Because once we said we were gonna do this, it was like dominoes. And all I had to do was just stay on the one that was in front of the one falling.